on cover of the Valalian News, you saw an article there written of the uh, exploits of Minister Abdul Halim Farrakhan down in, in the Caribbean. Today, we want you to hear from the man himself. Not just from print, but from the man himself. And if we needed an international representative, and indeed we did, and if we have to choose one to represent us internationally, and indeed we did, then I think that the Honorable Walla D. Muhammad made the best choice in giving to us, and as an international representative, our main speaker today, as I, as I introduce him to you, the Honorable uh, Abdul Halim Farrakhan. Salam alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. To Minister Abdul Karim Hassan, Western Regional Representative of the Honorable W.D. Muhammad, to the distinguished ministers on the rostrum, and to you, our distinguished brothers and sisters, it is a great honor for me to be here with you this afternoon. I've been up and down the coast <clears throat> and around the country and nearly around the world in the last six months and I didn't today. But all praises due to Allah sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> say anything, I want to say how very much I, as a follower of the Honorable W.D. Muhammad, appreciate my brother and your brother, your minister and mine, Minister Abdul Karim Hassan. We appreciate a strong man. We appreciate a man who soldiered hard under the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad and a man who now has increased duties that keep him moving about the western region because when you've got a strong man he can't sit still. When you've got a strong man he's got to share the strength that Almighty God has blessed him with, with those who might be a little weak and not able to walk as strongly and as firmly as some of you here in the Los Angeles area. And so your minister has to keep moving. And that's because the Honorable W.D. Muhammad has seen in him the strength the knowledge, the wisdom, the brilliance, and the administrative capability that makes him able not only to administrate this mosque, but to administrate a whole region and do it successfully. One of the things that 
separate children from adults is that children are very self-centered and very selfish. Children don't always like to share what they have with others. That's the mark of a child. I think it was Paul who said, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I understood as a child, I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, I had to put away childish things. We as a people have been engaged in a lot of childish behavior, though we are grown people, chronologically. Grown people biologically. Unfortunately, we have not been grown people mentally, morally, and spiritually. When we don't want to share the good that God has blessed us with, with those who are less fortunate, that shows that we have some growing up to do. When we don't understand that our minister has to travel and share that knowledge that he has been blessed with, with those who might not be as strong, we have a little growing left to do. Right. And when we, as the nation of Islam, come to the point in our knowledge where we don't want to share it with other human beings, then we have a lot of growing to do. So tonight, this afternoon, I don't mind talking to children. Because I'm taking food to grow up myself. But if there are any children in the house, we'd be glad to entertain you. We have a few bottles around. Baby bottles, that is. But we would hope that this afternoon we are talking with brothers and sisters who desire to be matured as mine. And so, as the chief minister says, this afternoon we want to have a conversation. You know, in the first resurrection, we did a lot of fire and brimstone preaching. <laughs> I guess that was necessary. Don't think that the fire is out now. It may get stoked up in just a minute or two. But brother and sister, we want to talk. We want to reason. We want to converse with you. And we want you to talk back. And we're going to try to be real quiet so we can hear what you say. Because you know you can't speak out. But if you think about the things that disturb you personally, that's what I want you to concentrate on tonight, today. Something is rolling around in your mind. You want to ask the question, but you're a little afraid because you don't want somebody to misunderstand you and think that you're not with the Honorable W.D. Muhammad. So you keep quiet and remain in the field of doubt, superstition, and wonder. I want you to ask those questions in your mind, all right? All the things about the movement of the nation of Islam that's disturbing you. All the things about the changes that have been made since the Honorable W.D. Muhammad accepted the office of leadership. I want you to hold them in your mind. Think about the thing that's disturbing you personally. And I don't care what's 
disturbing you. By the help and power of Almighty God who feeds minds to feed minds, we want this afternoon to settle arguments so we can get on with the grown-up work of remaking the world. Be patient with me. I would like to start by saying to you from Bible and Quran, there's a scripture in the Bible that reads, wise men change often, but a fool will not. I don't mind you applauding. No, it's all right. I understand. You know? But what I would like you to do, do what you want to do. People are talking in their minds, saying, oh God, what's happening to our nation? Some people are talking in their minds, and they're saying, oh, maybe Elijah Muhammad is turning over in his grave these things that are happening. Why change anything? I mean, what was wrong with it the way it was? Is change a repudiation of Master Elijah Muhammad and the great work and the hard striving and the sacrifice that that poor, wonderful man did for us all? Why should we change? I liked it better the other way. Archon, you used to preach for the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad. I want to know what you got to say about this thing. <laughs> I'm only talking about what you talk about. I feel so relaxed. I hope you just relax. Now we got to do some delicate surgery. <laughs> All right. Somebody said, when I said, wise men change often, but a fool will not. Somebody thought, well, yeah, but it also says in the scripture, I am God and I change. <laughs> well, that's true with God. Because Almighty God doesn't have to change. He is perfection. He doesn't have to grow. He has arrived. And he is the perfecter and the grower of all things. But since we are not the originator of the heavens and the earth, and we are creatures of the creator, toiling to find the creator, toiling to see his mind in the handiwork, of his creation. We should never be stagnant and say that we have located God. Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, said, any man who leaves his house in search of knowledge 
is in the path of Allah until he returns. I'm going to stop. Maybe that went by too fast. Any man who leaves his home in search of knowledge is in the path of God until he returns. When you leave home to search for knowledge, you should never return. Because there's so much knowledge out there, you can't return. But when you return, that's when you say, I found it all. I got it, so I'm coming home. Well, then that home means death. Right. But the living are the constantly learning. And the learning are the real livers. Making sense? And any time you say, I refuse to change. I will not change. I refuse. I refuse to change. I liked it better the old way. Not going to change. It's all right if that's the way you want it. But let's read. If I better take a mic with me because I sure don't want to. If If the first law of the universe is motion and everything in this universe is in motion, whether you see the motion or not, it's in motion. A rock is in motion. Even if you can't see motion in the rock, there is a molecular movement. And within the molecules, there is an atomic movement. And within the atom, there is a neutron, proton, and electron movement. Telling you that this whole universe is alive. It's in motion. Is that right? Okay. If it is alive, it's in motion, it must change. All right. Since we recognize that anything that is standing still is really regressing or retrogressing, the only way for man to move is forward. And if you're going to be in motion forward, what was yesterday is not necessarily going to be today. I, I want you to listen good. And what was good yesterday may not be good at all today. You say, well, Truth is always good. I'll argue back. That's right. I'll argue with you. My dear brother and sister, even truth is not always good if truth is out of time. What are you saying? I was just taking your mental position. <laughs> I want you to just be patient. Follow us down. Brother and sister, why would you say truth could be good in one instance 
bad in another. I'll give you a parable. Grapes fresh from the vine are good in one instance. Leave it too long. And the same grape that gave you energy in one instance will make you drunk in another. Is that right? Why? Time worked on the grape and caused something to happen to the chemistry of it. It underwent a chemical change. And that chemical change in the body would produce drunkenness. Well, what about knowledge? Uh, I hope that you will follow me. I'm just going to take my time. But I want you to concentrate on what I'm saying, then think and talk back. Listen. Every prophet brought what is called eternal principle. Things that never die. It's the same today as it was in the time of Adam and Abraham and Noah and Lot and Moses. But the people of Adam and Noah and Lot and Abraham and Moses were not as developed mentally, as sophisticated, technologically. Their world was not as our world is today. So their problems were not as complex as ours may be today. So the, they had a simple contemporary message that dealt with a contemporary problem. But after the problem was solved, you don't need that same uh, message. You need a new message. If you go to the doctor and you are sick and he gives you medicine. Why should you continue to take the medicine after you're well? If you are well, then you put the medicine up. But if you continue to take medicine even after your illness is cured, then the medicine will make you sicker than you were in the first instance. Just follow it down now. If Almighty God only had one teaching and didn't expect change to come, he would not have sent a succession of prophets. So you must understand from that that God had something in the earth growing. He set it in motion, he fed it, and he caused it to grow. Is that right? Very good. Today, some of us feel that the nation of Islam has made so many changes so fast that it throws the mind into confusion. But the man at the helm of this ship, the Honorable W.D. Muhammad, knows exactly what he's doing. He'll drop something out there and won't even explain it. And you will bring up out of your mind all your reasons why this thing should not be. What are you doing? He gave you a pill. And now you puked up something. Now you got a chance to look at what is in your own mind. So you can become acquainted with the hidden recesses of your being. And you'll never know what kind of being you are until you're challenged by new ideas. And before your stomach can settle, he'll 
throw another pill out there and won't explain. And you puke again. See, it's not a thing that you're accepting with joy. You're not saying, oh, isn't that wonderful? I like that that he's doing. At first, you say, I don't know. Why is this? I don't know about that. See, you're puking. I don't know. Son. See your attitude? He don't say anything because you got to get it all out. In order to feel clean and pure, to make yourself ready for your own growth, you got to cough up out of your system the thing that's in your mind that is a barrier to your development. And if you don't think that there are barriers in our minds, to our personal and social and human and divine development, you are out of your mind. Brother and sister, the Honorable W.D. Muhammad has been dropping bombs on the nation since he took office. And the whole black community is shook up. Not only are you shook as a Muslim, but the community is shook. Sometimes the community is so shook, the reason the Valalian news sales have gone down is the brother scared to go to the people. He, he, he said, look, man, I, every time I see it, they got a question for me. And I can't answer the question. I don't know how to tell them people what's going on. So hell, I ain't going by there no more.
He said, when he said, let white folks come in the temple and become a part of the nation. And that did it, man. That did it. Some of us ain't got over it yet. Some of us still here, but we're waiting for a wind to blow. Some of us sitting there saying, maybe God's going to come and straighten this thing out. Maybe the army Elijah Muhammad is going to come back. And, and uh, I don't believe he's dead, no way. Well, I'm trying to pick up on your mind. <laughs> and if you keep on walking with me, I think I have your mind pretty well after a while. Say, who's seen him in the castle? No, this was a thing. He just went away for three years, that's all. And he's letting the hypocrites take over everything. And we'll just hold on and be faithful. We know he'll return. All right, brothers and sisters, we don't want to waste a lot of time. But brothers and sisters, many of you, who criticize the Honorable W.D. Muhammad and say that he has departed from the teaching of his father. Really, how many of you really studied the teaching of his father? How many of you went into the teachings? I'm asking. Because many of you are so emotional Many of you, no, not many, most of you, you didn't read nothing. You came to the mosque and you let the minister read for you. You didn't study your lesson. You didn't study what he wrote. That's why everything that came out was almost a new revelation, though it's old knowledge that he wrote years ago. And those of you who think you study, we want to talk about it today. I'm here this afternoon as a lover of Master Farad Muhammad and as a lover of the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad, may peace be upon him, and as a lover of the Honorable W.D. Muhammad, who is my leader, teacher, and guide, and I have no other leader but the Honorable W.D. Muhammad. Wait a minute. I understand by the permission of Allah that in following the Honorable W.D. Muhammad, I am obeying Master Farad Muhammad and obeying the Honorable Master Elijah Muhammad. But many of you never did understand and so today we want to give understanding because you can't move until you understand what's going on and why. You hear the chief minister talking about body Christ. And we echo that. Body Christ. That the nation of Islam is the body Christ. Then 
Honorable W.D. Muhammad, why not go where you can find agreement? But the reason you stay is because there's something here so attractive that it keeps holding you. So now that you are here, why not be here in spirit rather than be here just in body? We're going to explain, by the help of Allah, all these concepts. All right. Brother and sister, everything that lives and moves must change. The nation of Islam is not undergoing revolutionary change. The nation of Islam is undergoing evolutionary change and there is a difference what is the difference revolutionary change is change that comes that undoes sweeps out an old order we are in a revolutionary change because the old world order is prophesied to go out and a new world order is prophesied to come in. Why is the old world order going out? Because the old world order disrespects divine, disrespects truth and righteousness, disrespects freedom, justice and equality. The old world order is racist. The old world order is sexist. The old world order is dualist. The old world order puts flesh against flesh and man against man. The old world order puts woman against man and man against woman. The old world order puts flesh against mind and mind against flesh. Creation against creator and creator against his creation. That foolishness has got to go. To make way for truth. What kind of truth? A truth that will show men their relationship to God and their relationship to one another. Truth that will show women and men our relationship to God and our relationship to one another. Truth that will show the relationship of the creation to the creator, the flesh to the mind. All right. Well, if the old world order is going to go out, and the Bible says it goes out with a big noise. Right. See all the noise you've been making since the chief minister started talking? I ain't made no noise. What has that been going on in your brain? If your brain hasn't been thundering right. with the opposing forces clapping inside your mind. Oh, you had a lot of noise going on. But the pain that you are undergoing, brother and sister, is a natural pain. You shouldn't be disturbed about it. Every mother receives the germ of life and joy, pleasure. She is not thinking when she receives the germ of life that in a short while that pleasure is going to bring her to some terrible pain. In the infinite wisdom of Almighty God, He keeps you away from pain because He knows you won't come to pain. You come to pleasure. So He offers you something that pleases you, knowing that ultimately it's going to bring you to pain. But if you can go through the pain, the pain will bring you into new birth. Right. Are you listening? Be patient with me, please. 
Mother, sometimes that pain is so great. Don't you curse the day you ever met that man? Am I right? In fact, some of you deliver your baby curses. But when you look at that little baby, at first when they bring it to you, you're happy, you believe that your pain is over. But when you look at that baby and begin to nurse that new life, see it grow and smile and prove, you forget all about that pain. In the joy of your new life. Brother and sister, so it is when you accept the germ of an idea that you receive in joy. And that idea takes root in the womb of the mind, even as a sperm takes root in the womb of the female. And as that idea begins to grow and grow and grow and grow, there's going to come a time when you're going to have pain to give birth to your idea. The womb is not the idea. The womb is the enclosure for the growth of the idea. So when the baby comes out of the womb, you never find no baby trying to crawl back in. Wait, 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 wait. I'm saying something. From the day that the baby leaves the womb, it don't even remember the womb. The memory of the womb is all wiped away. And the baby grows away from the womb. Is that right? So it is with knowledge. When you get a stage of knowledge, every stage of knowledge circumscribes for the people a womb. Good God, I want to see this. A womb is a dark place because all life is formed in the dark. Right. Is that right? right? Never in the light. It comes from the darkness into the light after it is formed. Is that right? When every prophet of God came and brought knowledge to the people, that knowledge gave the people a womb of development. A womb. A womb for the idea of righteousness and truth and good to gestate, to grow. And when another prophet came, that prophet came to open the womb of that first knowledge and bring you out into another womb of higher knowledge. Naturally, when the new prophet came, why do you think people reject him? Because he don't come telling the people what they want to hear. He tells the people something that's going to cause the people to grow and they're satisfied, they're comfortable. They don't want the pain of giving up all ideas. They don't want the pain of leaving archaic truths that have served their purpose behind. Excuse me for breaking up the house. I just want you to... Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, good. Everybody understand so far? You ever notice when somebody comes to you to tell you some truth that you don't want to hear? I'll make it real simple. Maybe he's been out with somebody else or something like that. Somebody comes to tell you about it. You don't want to hear it. It's pain, isn't it, to accept that kind of truth? Because in order to accept that kind of truth, you have to give up the old idea that he's faithful. Prophets have always had hard 
time. Okay? Now, let's bring this thing to a conclusion. Brother and sister, if you understand Master Elijah Muhammad's message, you would understand that it had a time limit on it. So many times, Master Elijah Muhammad would get us to a certain point at his table and he would stop teaching. And then he would say to us, I would tell you more, but some of you would turn you for critical. Then now, my God, what is it that you want to tell us that would turn us back and turn us against you? He would say to us, listen to him, he's a wise man. He would say, in fact, just before he passed, I was with him one day, just he and I were together, and it was a very strange set. He said to me, he said to Brother Farrakhan, and he was very sad, he said, in the future, when my name is mentioned, what they'll say about me is this. Oh, Elijah Muhammad, that man, yes, his teaching was good for that time, but it's not good for this time. He said it, and he dropped his head. As I read his expression, I read it not that in and hypocrisy was going to rise up and people would go against his teaching. But Almighty God brought him into the realization in the last days of his life about something about his teaching. Don't you remember that he gave us histories of Jesus? Don't you remember how the old man, according to the allegorical story, met Jesus, stayed with him three days and left? And that man wasn't seen anymore. It was just Jesus. And then in the last day, Jesus was reading in the scripture. And he found out that he was too soon to do the work that he had wanted to do. So he went out and gave his life for the truth that he taught. Why do you think he taught us that? Why do you think he taught us about how Muhammad, may peace be upon him, died broken heart because of something he wanted to do but it just wasn't the time and he didn't have the right substance to do it Master Elijah Muhammad told me that he was going to go away to study and he would come back with a new book he taught us that a new book was coming right why a new book? Because it's only a book that verifies the man and gives the man the knowledge of how to do his job. He said, my message is only a wake-up message. It's shock treatment to get a man that's mentally dead, alive and awake, but that's not the message that the man needs to go on and do his work after I wake him up. I got to go like Moses went to the mountain. I got to go and get the book. Right. Well, he's past, brother and sister. That should teach you something. You say, well, is he past? Yes, he is. I saw him. If you didn't see him laid out in that position, I did. I kissed his forehead in death as I did in life. And I knew then that his desires his desires for us as a nation, his desire for that greater knowledge, it was not to come in him or even to him. As David gathered the material, David couldn't build the house. David was the beloved of God, but David had a son that God said, well, David, your hands are too bloody. I'm going to let your son build the kingdom. You gathered the material, but your son is going to come along and build it. Don't you know if David gathered the material and Solomon built the house, that the house didn't look nothing like the material? Right. 
You go out there and gather up a whole lot of lumber and a whole lot of brick and a whole lot of marble and put it out there on the lot. And let another man come and put all that lumber and that marble together and make a house. You can't compare the lumber in its raw, unput together state with the building. Neither can you compare how you were in the first resurrection with the way the Honorable W.D. Muhammad is going to put together the house. But you don't understand what the house is. Fall it down. How did Elijah Muhammad call us? Did he call us? The nation of Islam, or did he call us the lost found nation of Islam in the West? The lost found. Well, what are you talking about, mister? If we are the lost found nation, or the lost found members of the nation, then the nation of Islam was already in existence before we came into the knowledge of it. We were lost to that knowledge. Yes, sir. And in the nation of Islam that came into fruition with the Holy Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, and the Holy Quran, there you have the dawn of a universal message. Since the world had become one world, we had to give humanity a message that would weld humanity together in the oneness of that work. So the nation of Islam could never speak to color. The nation of Islam could never speak to national boundaries. The nation of Islam could only speak to the oneness of God, the eternal principles of truth for no brotherhood of man can be based on the finite qualities of a finite biology. Listen good. This biology comes up out of the earth and it goes down into the earth. The brotherhood of man is not a brotherhood of skin. It is a brotherhood of divine mind. It don't come from the earth. It comes from the creator. Do you understand? talk to your mind now. Listen, brother and sister. You follow this down, brother and sister, please. I know it's hot in here, but the heat is coming up in your brain from the friction of ideas clashing. It's hotter than the heat in this room. So we want to cool off your mind. Put some oil in there and let them parts cool off because you're burning your brains out. All right, let's move on. Now, if we are the lost town members, where were we lost, brothers and sisters? We were lost, as the scripture says, in the wilderness of sin. A wilderness is bad enough because it's a place of wildlife. And why did the prophets see us in a wilderness? Because the people called the American people are a wild life. They are not tamed by the divine moral law of God. It's a country that people do as they please. You do your thing, I do my thing. That's a wild country. In the wilderness of sin. And sin is rebellion against the divine law. Some of us still in the wilderness. Some of us came out of the wilderness then run back into the wilderness. I want you to follow it down now. Brother and sister, the lost brother of the nation of Islam was found, but he was other than his own self. So the problem book says 12 leaders conferred in the root of civilization concerning the lost found members of the nation of Islam must return right. to their native land. Right? right? So one of the conference members 
by the name of Mr. Oshman Sarif said that they cannot return unless they get a thorough knowledge of their own, so they sent them a messenger to teach them of their own. Right. Meaning what? That you and I are lost from the nation of Islam. Right. We are lost from the society of the righteous people. And when we were found, we were found like the wild, sinful place in which we live. Right. Right. We were found aliens to God, aliens to civilization. We were found savages. Right. How can you take a savage and bring him into a civilized society until you first reform the savage, clean the savage up, right. make the savage right? right. Since Almighty God, I want you to hear me, please. All right. Almighty God knows that we are babies. So the Quran said he raised a prophet among every people. Right. You know why he had to raise a prophet among every people? Because people of different nationalities, people of different races, do not want to listen to anything coming to them from any other race that's not their own because of their childish development. Right? Are you ready? Therefore, God sends his truth and he clothes it in a channel so that the Chinese can see outwardly a veil that looks like themselves. But behind that veil is the word of Almighty God coming to the Chinese people. He sent Indian prophets, but he don't send a Caucasian to teach an Indian. He sends an Indian to teach an Indian because the Indian people can't respect people outside of themselves. They got to look for leadership first among themselves. So God veils his truth in the flesh color of a people. But behind that veil, God ain't Chinese. God is not Indian. God is not an Arab. God is not an African. God is not a Caucasian. God is independent of all of this, but he meets you through what you know to take you to some place that you don't know that he wants you to get acquainted with. <laughs> Listen. Are you ready? There were white prophets. God spoke to the Caucasian through members of his own race. And the Caucasian, some of them listened and some of them didn't. The point being that at one point or another, the Chinese Kung Fu Tse or Confucius passed away, but a word was there. Right. Buddha passed away, but a word was there. Zoroaster passed away, but a word was there. Moses, Jesus, Ibrahim, Adam, all of them passed away, but a word was there. Even among the Indians. If you go to the Indian tribes, you will hear knowledge and wisdom that resembles wisdom that you find in the scriptural pages of the book. Keep ruining things here, man. I want you, please, just bear with me. If, brother and sister, Indians have things in their rituals and in their knowledge that resemble the knowledge of the ancient scribes and religious masters, but they don't have no Bible. Well, where did they get theirs from? Their religious masters got their wisdom from the same place where the Bible got its from. 
the Bible is print words, but the real root of the Bible is the creator and the creation. And the Indians studied the creator and the creation and had their own religious message. Do you understand what I'm saying? But yet God is not an Indian. He appeals to your childish growth because he knew that we were able to outgrow color, different characteristics. He knew that we could look at flowers in the wilderness and we see all kinds and colors of flowers and we would pick those flowers and they don't have any special message of just but beauty. And we could look at rocks and we could see rocks of different hues and colors. And we could see different tracts of land laying side by side of different hues and colors. We could look in the jungle and watch the different beasts and animals and see their different colors, their different forms, their different shapes, their different characteristics. And we could reason with that. But when it came to meeting a man, breaking down the natural barriers that separated man from man. Barriers of mountain ranges, barriers of oceans, barriers of rivers and deserts and jungles. Man grew in knowledge and wanted to expand because the nature of man is to move out from where he is. So when man got enough knowledge to move out, he would cross rivers. And when he'd get on the other side, he would find somebody that didn't look like him. Immediately, he felt threatened. He saw somebody that didn't look like him. They had a religion. They had a God. They had a culture showing you that God is in the hearts and minds of every people, even the savage. Everybody got a God. It's the point of who is the real originator. See, everybody's growing toward God, brother and sister. All praise is due to Allah. For the Honorable W.D. Muhammad and a teaching that's growing us. All right, bear with me. As people discover people, we have different languages, different culture, different customs, different morality. People then become threatened by people. People go to war with people. As they go to war with people because they just shot children, they begin to understand each other's way of life. And when they can understand each other's way of life, then they begin to accept each other. And when they begin to accept each other, the world becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Until now, we don't need the God of Israel. We don't need the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We don't need the God of the Chinese or the God of the Indians or the God of the Africans. We need the God now who is the Lord of all the worlds. And when we meet the Lord of all the worlds, then in the Lord of the worlds, we can see the similarity of everything that looks so strange and different. And then we can bring the whole of man to oneness with God. All right, praise be to Allah. Now let's watch this pattern of growth. We start first as an individual. I'll just put individual. If you think like an individual, you know you're still a child. If you as a brother, only a concern for you, you don't have no concern for nobody else. You're sitting next to a man, but I ain't concerned with him. You're sitting next to a sister, but you're not concerned with her. Then you're an individualist. You want to be you, which is good, but you want to do things 
that may be pleasing to you which might be detrimental to others. So an individual is a small growth. It's an infant growth. So God puts individuals together and gives them a family. And when you're in a family, the husband and the wife must think and act as one. And if they think and act as one, they pull the children together into a unit of oneness. And the love of the mother for the father and the father for the mother helps the children to find love and compassion for each other. But it can't stop there. My family lives in a fine home, you know. And uh, my family uh, eats well. And I have uh, labored for a long time training my family in the ethics and the morals of decency. I tell my children, don't go across the street. I don't want you playing with those riffraff. I don't want you to have anything to do with these neighbors. I have a certain select group that I want you to associate with that are on your level, my dear. That, that sick mind didn't remember that a family and families make up a neighborhood. And a neighborhood with a neighborhood makes up a community. And communities make up nation. And nation make up world. But when you're selfish and you think only as an individual or only as a family unit, which is an enlarged individual, and you have no community concern, no community spirit, then one day you send your daughter and your son out into a neighborhood that you didn't give a skip about. And your daughter comes home a prostitute. And your son comes home a junkie. And you say, what, if, what is it? Oh, Heavenly Father, I've done my best, you know I did. Why is my son a junkie? Why is my daughter a prostitute? I gave them everything. But you gave them everything that you thought was valuable in a material sense. But you didn't give them human values. You didn't grow them with a legitimate human concern. So they went out into a neighborhood that had other ideas. Since you didn't want to work to reform your neighborhood, then the filth of your neighborhood came back into your house. So God, in his wisdom, don't want us to stop with our families. You start there. You don't stop. So families grow to tribes. This is the growth pattern. Tribes grow to nations. Then nations should grow into a world concern. All right? See the pattern of growth? See how God is growing the religious thing. God is growing the movement of man from family to tribe to nation. Now let's look at another move. As he's developing knowledge, scriptural knowledge, he's developing on the intellectual plane, on the political plane, and on the economic plane, he's also developing these same concepts. Listen, look at the wise God. He said, well, after you become a nation and you begin to industrialize, you begin to build your economics, that's when you learn you're not self-sufficient. There's something 
that you need for your people that maybe another people have. So now you got to enter into some kind of intercourse with nations. You can't stay isolated. You got to move on now into trade and commerce. Which means there's got to be mutual respect now of an international code of laws. Something that's going to make the national family one. The economic family one through World Bank. International law. Arabs got oil. But Arabs don't have water. Look at how wise God is. He put cocoa in Ghana and coffee in South America and bauxite in Jamaica huh? and tin somewhere else and rubber somewhere else and fruits and vegetables somewhere else and he said look at look at me man I mean look at me man did you fix that one? boy poor fella I guess It's all right now, huh? Good. He said, look at me, man. Can't you see that I'm showing you your need for one another? Can't you see, man, that I'm showing you that there is one creator, one creation, and one life? And that what I have been leading you to from the time I gave you birth in the world was to struggle to find oneness, to find unity, to find God. The concept of one is the strongest concept in creation. So teaches the Honorable W.D. Muhammad. In mathematics, you can't even begin the mathematical language until you start with one. And no matter how well you count, you're only expressing one many times over. Look now, you ready? You ready for this? All right. Fifty is only one expressed fifty times. You can't get away from one. See how you started and I started? You and I started from a sperm, but it couldn't make it by itself. Good God. Sister had the egg, man had the sperm. The sperm and the egg had sense enough to get together. Look, man, the sperm didn't look like the egg and the egg. All right. I must be messing everything up in here. Okay, I, I know what it is. I stepped on the wire and pulled the plug. All right. They need each other, right? So they come through what? Look at the wisdom of Almighty God, the Creator. This is who we're studying. Here, all of us started from sperm, right? You ready for this? The sperm is placed in the vaginal tract of the female. And that environment is hostile, opposed to the life of that sperm. So the sperm now is trying to find its mate and unite to become one. So God has ordained struggle for oneness. He's ordained struggle for unity. Are you listening? He puts you in a hostile environment and says, okay, swim. Your prize is the egg and unity and the conception of life, but you can't even begin life until you come to one. You got it? You're not life, you're just motion. 
You don't become life until you have order in your motion that produces oneness. Brother and sister, the sperm in a hostile environment, it ain't one sperm. God in his wisdom permits a million or ten million at one time. Let you know that I want to see how bad you want that unit. Some of you talk that talk. You child. Now this is the way God would talk to you if you, you know, in your hip language, you use a child. You know what? You don't want unity bad enough to struggle for it. Husband and wife say, "I love you, baby," and she say, "I love you too." But hell, they don't know that it's a struggle to come to one. So the first little upset that come, he run to the divorce court or she run because why? You lie. You don't want unity. You don't want oneness. You want something easy. But nothing worthwhile in life is God. Yeah, yeah it's on now. Okay. Hang on. It's all right. It's okay. Everybody all right? Give me a few more minutes. Brother and sister, that sperm is in competition with other sperm, isn't it? Now that's the second test. Not only it got, has it got to master a hostile environment, but the chances for it being unified is maybe one in a million, or one in ten million, but it has a determination that going to show you that whenever you start out on a path to find the unity of God and the unity of your family and the unity of a nation and the unity of a world, you started out on a path of struggle and the very environment and the very competition is going to test the strength of your desire. And not only that, but the sperm has to swim up against the force of gravity. So when a man say he want God, he wants unity, you got to swim up, you got to pull up against the gravity of selfishness, the gravity of greed, the gravity of niggardliness, the gravity of selfishness, the gravity of biological passions that keep you bound to a lower level of life. You got to pull up. And so that sperm ultimately meets the egg. A union takes place and life begins. Isn't that beautiful? But there's something more significant than that. Look, that egg and that sperm meeting form one cell. See that? Two halves met, formed one, then broke up. Study the sperm and the, and the first cell. It begins to break down, doesn't it? Multiply, doesn't it? And it looks like it's going away, doesn't it? From the principle of one. But before you know it, it starts coming right back to one again. Because now you got a body of billions and billions of cells. But it's only one body. You got many systems, but one body. You got many systems, but one head on that one body. Can't get away from one. All right, let's move on. Look here. You ready? Brother say, look brother, I'm a Mexican. Brother say, well, I'm a West Indian. 